Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 469th episode, we're doing something a little bit different. We're crossing over with ourselves in our ninth episode of I Know Paleo. Yes, I just want to say thank you to everyone listening to this episode. Again, it being a crossover with ourselves is an extra special bonus episode of I Know Paleo. And I Know Paleo is our monthly show, our bonus show for our Triceratops patrons and above. Every month we put a poll on Patreon to decide the topic of the episode. And for episode nine, we're talking about mammoths. Mammoths tied for second place recently. So we wanted to share. And this is the kind of paleo content that you can get if you're a dino at all, again, at the Triceratops or above on our Patreon. Because for I Know Dino, we mostly talk about dinosaurs, but we wanted to expand somehow. Mm-hmm. And for our current patrons, if you have any feedback or questions, make sure to post it in our I Know Paleo Discord channel. We'll be posting our next survey soon with some of the top contenders from previous polls. And in the meantime, we hope you enjoy this extra special bonus, bonus episode. <laughs> bonus, bonus episode? Yes. <laughs> We are going to be doing another episode of I Know Paleo this month. So as usual, if you're a Triceratops patron, you'll get a bonus episode of I Know Paleo. Is that why this is a bonus bonus? Exactly. <laughs> Should we spoil what the usual bonus episode is? Sure. Glyptodonts. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I might like those better than mammoths. Oh, mammoths are pretty cool. <laughs> they are pretty cool. And just the whole evolution up to them is really fascinating, too. But before we get into all of that, as always, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we want to thank Joaquin, Elvie, Ian, Darren and Miss Olive, Chris, Paul M., Dino Dork, Hoarder Venator, Mary, and Talon. Yes, again, thank you so much for being a Dino at all. And it is because of you we're able to do I Know Dino every week and I Know Paleo every month. Sometimes twice a month. <laughs> <laughs> well, just this month so far. Yeah. So to kick off our mammoth discussion, I think it's worth discussing where mammoths came from. I would say this is a mammoth discussion because there's a lot to say. There is a lot to discuss. But fortunately, the history of mammoths, I'm going to start with at least, isn't as long as dinosaurs because I'm not going to go all the way back to the first mammals. I could, mm -hmm. and then we go back, you know, 240 million-ish years, and we'll be going right alongside dinosaurs for a long time. That feels like a separate show or <laughs> a, a number of bonus episodes. Yeah. And all those early mammals were kind of small. They didn't really have much in common with modern mammoths, and there isn't really a whole lot of overlap between what was going on in the Mesozoic versus what started to change right after dinosaurs went extinct, or the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. So then the question is, how did we go from a small mouse-like mammal or maybe a badger-sized mammal at the largest that was around at the end of the Mesozoic to the largest land animals alive today, as well as the largest land animals alive in the Pleistocene with mammoths? Mm -hmm. So elephants and mammoths are from the group Proboscidea. And as far as we know, the first Proboscidean evolved right after dinosaurs went extinct, I say as far as we know, because that has recently changed, <laughs> we have this book on mammoths from 2007 that was really useful for researching this episode. Yes, there are a lot of great sources, but the main one for this episode is the book Mammoths, Giants of the Ice Age. This is by Adrian Lister and Paul Ban. And if you're looking for an, a primer on mammoths, we recommend this book. Yeah, it's really good. It has lots of good illustrations and lots of good photos, too, because with mammoths, there are a lot of mummies, so you get lots of cool pictures, too. And then also a lot of good descriptions of how they evolved, what's going on with their horns and trunks and all sorts of cool stuff. But in that book, since it was written in 2007, it has the earliest proboscidean as 55 million years ago, whereas just a few years after the book was written... There was another one described from 60 million years ago, basically right after the KPG boundary. Mm. So it wouldn't be surprising if proboscideans eventually crossed over that threshold and we find a proboscidean that was just before dinosaurs went Ooh, extinct. That would be interesting. I should mention that proboscideans are a subset of Afrotheria, and Afrotheria goes back 5 million years before dinosaurs went extinct to 65 million years ago. And that is a broader category. It actually includes 
aardvarks and dugongs. What? So <laughs> if you're wondering what the closest living relatives to elephants are that are not elephants, aardvarks and dugongs <laughs> are high on that list. I would not have guessed. <laughs> yeah, dugong kind of makes sense. You know, it's like a big, weird animal. With, it's sort of got like a little bit of a trunkish mouth thing going on. But I would not have expected aardvarks. I guess they kind of have a similar head too in some ways. But totally different looking. There's also this little mouse sized thing called a hyrax, which is a close relative too. Hmm. So it could be too that one of those things gets categorized into proboscidea or these very early proboscideans from just after dinosaurs when extinct later get moved out of proboscidea and become afrotherians. And then technically, you know, the earliest proboscideans will be later. Still pretty new discovery, so it's hard to say. But assuming that these very early paleogene animals were proboscideans, the first proboscidean and the oldest one is called Erytherium, which was found in Morocco. And the named Erytherium means old beast. <laughs> Fitting, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes Therium gets translated as animal. Sometimes it gets translated as beast. I'm going to go with beast because I think that's more fun. And then, yeah, they just called it the old one. It, it makes sense, like you said, because it's old, especially for a proboscidean. It only weighed about five kilograms or 10 pounds, and it was really tiny at only about 20 centimeters or eight inches tall. I'm really used to dinosaur measurements where they're so slender and lanky. So something that weighs 10 pounds is a lot bigger than eight inches tall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this is a stocky little guy. <laughs> <laughs> a stocky mammal. <laughs> yep. So it weighed roughly about the same as a house cat, but obviously it was a little denser. It was shaped kind of like a pig. It was long and low to the ground. It had the cute little beginnings of tusks in the form of extra long incisors, but its mouth was mostly full of molars. Just like mammoths. Yes. Yeah. So that's, I think, one of the things that's a defining characteristic of it being a proboscidean. And it also is sometimes depicted as having a little bit of a trunk, but usually it isn't depicted as having much of a trunk, if any. Maybe just a little bit bigger of a snout. Mm. About 4 million years after Erytherium, also from the same area of Morocco, we get the second known proboscidean, and that's Phosphotherium. It basically means phosphorus beast. <laughs> it's because it was found in a soil sediment that had a lot of phosphates in it. So they named it after phosphorus, basically. All right. It was about three times the size of Erytherium, coming in at a massive 17 kilograms or 37 pounds. Ooh. And it was about 30 centimeters or a whole foot tall at the shoulder. So if you think of Erytherium being house cat sized, then Phosphotherium was about the size of a large dog or maybe a medium sized dog. But it still didn't have tusks. It did have a slightly longer face than Erytherium, although still probably no trunk to speak of. And it's considered semi-aquatic and it probably ate vegetation in the water. I've also seen that said about Erytherium. I'm not sure though, that might just be conjecture based on what we know of Phosphotherium. Hmm and other relatives. So I'm going to jump way ahead another 20 million years and go over to Egypt, where we get to Moritherium. And Moritherium means the beast from Lake Morris, Ooh. which is in Egypt. That's a nice name. Yep. It also kind of sounds like a movie poster title, mm -hmm. the beast from Lake Morris. <laughs> so this one was about 35 to 37 million years ago, if you're keeping track of how far we've gone ahead in time. By this point, the order Proboscidea had increased not only in the size of the individual animals, but also in the size of the family tree. There was a lot of diversity going on at that point. This Moritherium weighed about 230 kilograms, or about 500 pounds, which makes it about 10 times the size of Phosphotherium. So you can tell there's some pretty rapid evolution, geologic time scale speaking, of these animals in terms of growing. Mm-hmm. It was about 70 centimeters or 2.3 feet high at the shoulder. And that makes Moertherium roughly the size of a pygmy hippo. If you've ever seen those, they're a lot smaller than like a regular hippopotamus. But you went from house cat to pygmy hippo. So, yeah, that is quite <laughs> the growth. Yeah. It also had a body that was quite a bit like a pygmy hippo, sort of very rotund, barrel shaped vibe. 
And given that it looks so much like a hippo, it was probably more on the aquatic side of the semi-aquatic spectrum. It had pretty short, stumpy legs that don't seem like they would have been all that useful on land. More Ethereum was starting to develop some pretty good tusks. The tusks would have been mostly concealed like they are in a hippo. If you've ever seen a hippo open its mouth wide open, it's got some intense tusks. Yes. <laughs> both on the top and the bottom, which is how they could just like bite into watermelons like oh, nothing. I love those videos. <laughs> but yeah, watch out for hippos. Yeah, they're incredibly intimidating. And they kill a ton of people. Hmm, downer. Yeah. I should mention that more Ethereum wasn't closely related to a hippo. It's just convergent evolution that makes them look so similar. Again, more closely related to dugongs and aardvarks. <laughs> but its face wasn't at all like a hippo. It was quite long. It may have also had the beginnings of a trunk. And if you want to think of a modern animal that might have looked more like more Ethereum, you could think of a taper or a tapir, if you pronounce it that way. Basically, it looks like it's got an extra long upper lip that sort of droops down into a little bit of a trunk. Hmm. I think tapers use it to sort of slurp up vegetation. <laughs> They're very interesting <laughs> animals. <laughs> Around the same time as more Ethereum, we get the first elephantiforms. And the first one that I think we know of is Paleomastodon, Ooh. aka the ancient mastodon. It had a mass of over two and a half tons, so we're really bumping up our scale in terms of weight, and it was 2.2 meters or 7.2 feet tall at the shoulder. It had a pair of tusks on the top and another pair on the bottom, just like more Ethereum, like mm. we were just talking about, but these tusks were quite a bit longer, and the mandibular tusks are the ones that are on the bottom, on the jaw basically extended the lower jaw like a big shovel. They're hmm. sort of like stuck together really tightly. So it's like a pair of teeth sticking way out from the mouth to extend it. It looks a little bit like a fossil of a Montosaurus without the keratin preserved. You know how the like bottom duck beak sort of look? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the big like shovely scoop. That's kind of what it looks like on the bottom. It's even longer. For a long time, they thought that all these animals used them to sort of shovel up wet vegetation, but they think that Paleomastodon might have actually used its scoop-like lower jaw to scrape bark off trees and to uproot plants. Interesting. Yeah. Other relatives might have used it with aquatic plants, though. For millions of years, the upper tusks, lower tusks, and trunk evolved together, and there is a ton of variability in the tusks of proboscideans. Maybe one day we'll get into the whole branch of Dinotheridae, which are the terrible beasts <laughs> that had lower tusks that sort of pointed back towards their chest. They sort of like curve back inwards. Ooh. It makes it look like their mouth is sort of permanently broken open in a weird way. It's very unusual looking. We don't have anything like that today, but they were pretty diverse and mm -hmm. all over the place. I mean, even mammoth tusks are pretty interesting. Yeah, and like the difference between mammoths and mastodons, the shape and position. But in general, as the tusks got longer, their heads got heavier. And as a result, their heads had to get shorter, so sort of like closer to their body and have a sturdy neck in order to hold up the weight of all that leverage of those tusks sticking way out. So when you combine those long tusks, the short neck, the tall legs, it meant that they couldn't really get their mouth down to the ground in order to eat. Hmm. And then the trunk comes to the rescue, allowing them to still get food and water. Even with these, sometimes I think up to 16 foot long, I think that's the record for the longest mammoth tusk. <laughs> <laughs> you could imagine with a 16 foot long tooth sticking down out of your head, it'd be pretty hard to bend down to get a drink. Yep. One of these early trunked proboscideans was Gomphotherium. Its name means nail beast, and that's for its double set of long straight tusks. It was around about 20 million years ago. A double set. Yeah. So basically, like I was saying, the Paleomastodon had sort of a scoop from its bottom set of tusks. These look just a lot more like the top set of tusks. They're not connected and they're not scoop-like 
It's just the regular pointy tusks mm. that you might imagine. So it's got a pair on the top and a pair on the bottom. Sort of like four chopsticks coming together. <laughs> might be how I describe it. There are actually two species, but the larger of the two species was about seven tons, which is almost three times as heavy as Paleomastodon and getting up towards the weight of modern elephants. It was also over three meters or 10 feet tall, and its tusks were stuck out pretty straight and kind of intersected together as it closed its mouth. The trunk was a little bit longer than the tusks, which is kind of important if you want to be able to use the trunk. However, over time, slowly in the lineage that led to mammoths, the lower tusks were reduced to where it was just sort of a tiny bump of bone that you can't even see under the lower lip, hmm. although they kept the trunk and the upper tusks. So the lower tusks weren't as useful, maybe. Not in the environment they were in. Well, that's a good lead into mammoths. Before we get into that, though, we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. And now on to our featured proboscidean, or featured elephanted, elef elephanted, <laughs> have trouble with that word, <laughs> mammothus, you mentioned earlier, mastodons, Garrett, so yeah, mammoths are not to be confused with mastodons, they're actually distant relatives of each other, but mammoths, going back to the tusk talk, they're known for their long curved tusks. And mammoths lived from the Pliocene around 5 million years ago to the Holocene about 4,000 years ago, which is very different timelines than we talk about with dinosaurs. Yeah, that 4,000 years ago number was really surprising to me. Mm -hmm. And they're probably basically all wiped out by people. That might be spoiling what you were going to say later. Well, I would disagree. With <laughs> the humans played a minor role, but yes, you are spoiling. Okay, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, woolly mammoths lived up until about 4,000 years ago. There were a few sites. It was like they were slowly dying out, and then the last of them were about 4,000 years ago. They lived all over, though, mammoths. They were in Africa, Europe, Asia, and North America, and there are multiple species. Currently, there's 10 that are considered valid. We'll mostly focus on the woolly mammoth for this featured segment. But I do want to talk about mammoths a little bit in general. So the different species are known based on the number of enamel ridges on their molars. Earlier species had fewer ridges. And later mammoths also had longer crowns of their teeth and the skulls were taller in height and also shorter in length. The oldest known mammoth is Mammothus subplaniforms. It lived in the early Pliocene in what's now southern and eastern Africa. The largest known mammoth species weighed 12 to almost 16 tons, and they were about 13 to almost 15 feet or four to four and a half meters tall at the shoulder. You doubled again to <laughs> the largest one that I was talking about. <laughs> I mean, they live up to their name, Mammoth. That's true. Which I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. Also, there's some interesting uh, etymology. But most mammoth species weren't that big. They were actually more similar in size to modern Asian elephants weighing three to six tons. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Still impressive, but compared to 12 to 16 tons. I do want to give a shout out to the Colombian mammoth. It's been found in the La Brea tar pits. It lived around the same time as the woolly mammoth. But um, again, I'm focusing on the woolly mammoth for this episode. The La Brea tar pits do have some really amazing mammoth specimens. Yeah, that is a fun place to visit if you get a chance. There were also some dwarf mammoths. One dwarf mammoth was Mammothus lamamori, which lived on the Mediterranean islands in the late middle and late Pleistocene. They're estimated to be 4.6 feet or 1.4 meters tall at the shoulder and estimated to weigh between 930 to 3,640 pounds or 420 to 1,650 kilograms. Another was Mammothus Columbi that lived on the Channel Islands of California at the end of the Pleistocene. Channel Island mammoths were between almost five feet to more than six feet or one and a half to 1.9 meters tall at the shoulder. There was also the pygmy mammoth, Mammothus exilus, 
and Mammothus creticus, which lived in the earlier middle Pleistocene in Crete and was estimated to be about 3.3 feet or one meters tall oh. at the shoulder and weighed 400 pounds or 180 kilograms. That's the cutest of the pygmy mammoths yes. <laughs> or the dwarf mammoths, I should say. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of range in sizes here. And then we've got the last species, which is Mammothus primigenius, and that's the woolly mammoth. Not a dwarf, though. Just a regular mammoth. Yes, they were about the same size as modern African elephants. So a little bigger than the average mammoth. Yeah. That is interesting, though, because I, I feel like as a kid, I always assumed woolly mammoths were much bigger than elephants. Maybe it was, again, my dinosaur bias, where it's mm -hmm. like extinct things were so much bigger, but really, woolly mammoths are about the same. I had the same thought, although we've been going to the zoo more often lately, and African elephants are quite large. <laughs> they are huge. <laughs> They're insanely big. Like you were saying, you know, upwards of 10 feet tall at the shoulder, mm -hmm. and then they've got this huge head and massive tusks and everything. Is they're imposing animals. Oh, yeah. So I'm sure the woolly mammoth was also imposing, mm -hmm. especially with the tusks. It's got a lot of meat on those bones, though. You really <laughs> want me to get into the human aspect part. <laughs> I can't help it. Look, when it came to humans, yes, humans did hunt mammoths, but it's difficult to prove if humans were the cause of their extinction or not because there's no direct evidence that the hunting was more than an occasional activity. Hmm. I'm still just so apt to quickly blame humans for making animals go extinct, because we've done it so many times that it seems like a pretty simple explanation. Well, there is a debate on if they went extinct due to climate change or humans overhunting them. Earth was getting warmer about 12,000 years ago. Glaciers retreated. Sea levels rose. And there were more forests than open woodlands and grasslands. But climate change had happened before in the Ice Age without leading to similar extinctions of megafauna or the large animals. So yeah. that probably wasn't the only factor. Yeah, there have been quite a few cycles of warmer, colder, warmer, colder. Although I, I did see what you were talking about where they were saying basically that mammoths, especially something like a woolly mammoth, is pretty well adapted for cold environments. And as it gets hotter... It could be a problem. Also, there was an issue of what sort of forest or non-forested land is available. Yeah. And things like that. And they, woolly mammoths ate a lot of grass. So having the open areas was good. But when it went away, that was bad. Yeah. 4,000 years ago just lines up pretty well with people hunting. <laughs> well, a lot of large mammals went extinct around the same time as mammoths. And with large animals... They tend to have smaller populations and a slower rate of reproduction. Hmm. 4,000 years ago, though, is so recent. I saw multiple people make the point that when mammoths went extinct, the Egyptian pyramids had already been built in Giza. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty wild to think about. Yeah. There is a hypothesis that mammoths got an infectious disease, possibly introduced by humans or humans' pets, but that seems unlikely. <laughs> That's a pretty interesting theory. <laughs> What's more likely is that it's a combination of factors. There was a 2021 study of DNA from the environment that found that mammoths went extinct probably because of climate change and vegetation changes. They were losing their habitats, which meant they were losing their food sources, and that was just bad for them. Yeah. But anyway, they lived for a pretty good chunk of time. The woolly mammoth in particular lived about 400,000 years ago up until about 4,000 years ago. Most woolly mammoths did die out about 10,000 years ago, but like we were saying, there were some populations that survived until about 4,000 years ago. Uh, many mammoth specimens have been found, not just woolly mammoth, but other kinds of mammoths. There's one site known as the Mammoth Site in Hot Springs, South Dakota in the Black Hills, where bones from at least 61 individuals of mammoths have been found. So probably there was a sinkhole that filled with water from a hot spring, and then that would have lured them in, and they would have been attracted by the warm waters and then slipped into the pool and died of starvation or drowning. Uh, some of the bones look like the mammoths trying to get back up. Oh. Yeah. That's pretty laborious tar pitsy, too. That's true. There was one baby mammoth found in 2007 that shows that it may have eaten the poop of adult mammoths. Hmm. 
It didn't have fully developed teeth for chewing grass, and fungi was found on dung and spores in nearby vegetation, which the baby would have eaten. Mammoth calves had a lot of fat to help them keep warm. It took a long time for a mammoth calf to be born. There was a gestation period of 22 months. Oh, yeah, that's like, is that the same as elephants? Are elephants 24 months? Yeah, the African bush elephants, 22 months. Asian elephants are 18 to 22 months. Oh, okay. So it's the same. Yeah. Well, that could be useful for things that I think your fun fact is about. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. It's also useful because like with dinosaurs, how a lot of times the research compares birds and crocodilians because those are the closest living relatives. With mammoths, you can compare them to elephants. And like elephants, mammoths were maybe matriarchal and social. Hmm. Yeah, I know you were talking about how we went to the zoo. The last time we were there, there was just one African elephant and it's a male. And we were like, oh, no, it must be lonely. And there was a sign up that said female elephants like to be in groups. It didn't say anything about males liking to be in groups. So, yeah, the matriarchal side of it makes sense. Yeah, I felt sorry for the elephant, though. It seemed fine. Yeah. I assume the zookeepers know what they're doing. They said that they moved the female elephant because they wanted it to be around more elephants. More make, female elephants. Yeah, <laughs> to make it happier. That's true. While both male and female mammoths had tusks, some mammoths have been found with genitals, so we know if they were male or female. It's not something we can say with dinosaurs. Nope. The tusks are pretty cool because the growth lines in them can tell you the age of the mammoth. Yeah, that's so cool. They do like a, a core sample, like they're drilling into rock or something is the way they sample it. They don't slice through the whole thing to do it at like a histology ring like they do with dinosaur bones. They just go straight in. I think it's more consistent, so you don't need as destructive of a sample. Mm -hmm. Mammoths had milk tusks before they had their massive permanent tusks. <laughs> the milk tusks came around when they were age six months and they lasted about a year. Milk tusks. Yeah. They must call it that because I think some animals, they call them milk teeth. So that's milk tusks. I think so. <laughs> the mammoth tusks, they spiral or they corkscrew, and then the tusks twist in opposite directions. Speaking of interesting tusks. Hmm. Because mammoths have the more curved tusks, right, than yep. mastodons? Exactly. And mammoths may have used their tusks for intraspecies combat. They maybe also use them to plow snow, break up ice to eat in the winter, you know, if there's not water, or strip bark and dig up plants. Some mammoths, unfortunately, had severe tooth decay, and some even had cancerous growths. Oof. And I'll get into how the word mammoth came about, sort of, in a bit, but first we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. Now, it's unclear where and how the word mammoth came about exactly. It's possible it's from an Arabic word, mehemat, derived from the Hebrew word behemoth, which is the name for the primeval creature mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible. That was a large, strong animal with curved horns or tusks and believed to eat a lot of grass and water and have a mild and peaceful nature. It does sound pretty accurate. Yeah. There's a... Another view that the name mammoth comes from various northern languages, possibly like mamut in Estonian. Uh, ma means earth and mut means mole, which links the name to this widespread belief that the animal burrowed beneath the ground. Hmm. That was a kind of a legend for a while about the mammoth. I mean, a lot of large animals do dig into the ground, like bears and things. So it's not surprising that a, a large animal would make a burrow. It's also interesting because we were talking about how mammoths coexisted with people mm -hmm. for so long, like even into the time when there was human civilization. It wouldn't be surprising if, you know, because basically written language was around <laughs> <laughs> when mammoths were around, if, if somebody was like writing about mammoths and the people continued to talk about it for generations after they went extinct. And there's definitely a lot of art of mammoths. Humans were producing art in the latter part of the Ice Age, and that was about 35,000 to 11,500 years ago. It was mostly horses and bison, but after that came mammoths in terms of which one was depicted the most. Mm. 
There's over 500 representations known in paintings and caves and engravings on bone, stone, antler, and ivory. There's also stone plaques and carvings, tools from bones, jewelry, huts made of mammoth bones have been found. Wow. That takes a lot of hunting to get all those mammoth bones. No, it's scavenging. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're really trying to blame humans here. <laughs> I am. I've got a bone to pick with them. Yeah. <laughs> The word mammoth was introduced to Europe in 1618 to 1620 by Richard Johnson, who reported on the memanto tusks found in Siberia. And then the word mammoth was widespread in Europe by the 18th century. John Bell said in 1722 that the tusks were well known in Siberia, and they were often found in washed out riverbanks. Siberians and the Inuit thought that mammoths were alive because there were bodies emerging from the permafrost since the Ice Age, and that included flesh and blood that was exposed by rivers and thawing. So it was thought that mammoths were a giant mole that occasionally came to the surface like a whale, but then died immediately when exposed to the sun or moonlight, and that explained why nobody saw one alive. I love that legend. That is <laughs> such a fun explanation. Because yeah, if you find an animal that's laying there bleeding, and it clearly was buried, what would you think? Like, yeah. Obviously, you'd think it was just alive. You wouldn't think, oh, this thing died 10,000 years ago and froze solid that whole time and mm -hmm. just now thawed. Yeah, it'd be very hard to know that. <laughs> and a lot of specimens were found with full stomachs. Some of them drowned or they were buried alive in a mud flow or the ground above them caved in. So there are a lot of legends of mammoths. There's some Chinese text from 1712 that says, quote, the northern plain near the sea in Russia is the coldest place. There's a kind of beast which, like a mouse as big as an elephant, crawls in tunnels and dies as it meets the sun or moonlight. The native people often find it near the riverbank, end quote. Sometimes mammoth tusks were seen as talons of a vast bird or antlers of a giant deer or horns of a huge male goat. That would be a really impressive bird that had a talon that's like 10 feet long. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so the first attempts to draw a mammoth based on the bones led to some strange unicorn-like beasts or an ox with hooves and a great single horn on the forehead. Because surely no animal would have multiple of these huge horns. <laughs> <laughs> Unicorns are popular. And mammoth bones were often thought to come from giants before they were known to be from mammoths. Hans Sloan in 1728 studied teeth and tusks from Siberia and suggested that instead of giants, they belonged to elephants, so got a little bit closer. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach named Elephus primigenius in 1799, which made the woolly mammoth the same genus as the Asian elephant, and that name means firstborn elephant. Oh, the primigenius? Mm-hmm. Firstborn and then Elephus, elephant. In 1828, Joshua Brooks used the name Mammothus borealis for fossils in his collection that he put up for sale. George Cuvier identified mammoths as an extinct species of elephant in 1796. And Thomas Jefferson, interestingly, helped make the word mammoth mean something large. There was a description of a large wheel of cheese, the Cheshire Mammoth Cheese, that was given to him in 1802. It weighed 1,230 pounds. That's a lifetime supply of cheese right there in a single wheel. I wonder if it was fully eaten. <laughs> yeah. Did he eat it? <laughs> well, I don't, think, follow -up question. I don't think one person could eat all that cheese. I assume that it was like a, a collectible, it mm. sounds like. If it has a name, like, are you, you going to eat the mammoth cheese? Well, why not if it's given to you as a gift? <laughs> I don't know the details of the cheese, only that it was called the mammoth cheese. <laughs> and he wasn't the only one using the term mammoth to mean something big. There's a baker in Philadelphia that had mammoth bread. A man in Washington said he was a mammoth eater. And someone in New York grew a 20-pound mammoth radish. Mm. So there was something in the air there. About mammoth and big. Jefferson did send Lewis and Clark on their mission partly to find a living mammoth. Oh, I didn't realize he was open to find a living one. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that was like cherry on top kind of thing. Okay, I just looked up that Cheshire mammoth cheese because mm -hmm. I needed to know more about it. You needed to? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's actually named after the town Cheshire in Massachusetts. 
which apparently the whole town gathered up all their cows and got all the milk from all the cows in order to make a huge thing of cheese for <laughs> Jefferson. And they made a cheese press, which there is a monument for this cheese press that they made because obviously it's a very large press. A mammoth press, one might say. Yeah. Apparently it actually wasn't every cow. They didn't allow any federalist cows because of political reasons. <laughs> I think they joked that it would make the cheese taste bad if they used cows from the wrong political party. Wow. And it was four feet wide and 15 inches thick. That's quite dense. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought that would weigh half a ton, a four foot wide wheel. They had to transport it on a sleigh. <laughs> Just like some fossils. <laughs> yeah, it was too heavy for wheels. Are you done with the cheese? Can we get back to the mammoths? I guess so. I can't figure out if he ate it or not. I really want to know if anyone knows if somebody ate the Cheshire mammoth cheese. Please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I love cheese. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On to the woolly mammoth. So the woolly mammoth, again, the name is Mammothus primogenius, and it's one of the last mammoth species. At first, it was thought to be an elephant. Both Blumenbach and George Cuvier found the bones of what was called at the time Elephus primogenius. They knew that it was from an extinct species that led to the new name Mammothus primogenius. Because they didn't want it to have the same genus name as a living species? Presumably. Researchers studied ancient DNA and found, though, that the woolly mammoth was closely related to Asian elephants, also known as Elephus maximus. So it's not too far off there. Mm -hmm. Other DNA studies found that woolly mammoths reproduced with other mammoth species sometimes, too. Woolly mammoths lived across northern Eurasia and North America, and like you were saying earlier, Garrett, yes, they coexisted with early humans. Woolly mammoths were probably social. There are cave paintings that show them in groups, and fossils have been found in groups. Their habitat is known as mammoth steppe, or tundra steppe, and it had a lot of grass. The woolly mammoth lived in rich, grassy vegetation that was largely devoid of trees, it had clear skies, long hours of sunlight, moderate amounts of rain. Frozen woolly mammoths have been found in Siberia and North America. Also skeletons, teeth, gut contents, poop. And, of course, woolly mammoths have been depicted in prehistoric cave paintings. Even though they were closely related to the Asian elephant, they were closer in size to the modern African elephant, with males weighing about 4 to 9 tons and being 8.8 .8 to 11 and a half feet, which is about 2.6 to three and a half meters tall at the shoulder, and females weighing about three to 4.4 tons and being seven and a half to eight and a half feet or 2.3 to 2.6 meters tall at the shoulder. And a newborn calf would have weighed about 200 pounds or 90 kilograms. I guess that makes sense since it took 22 months to gestate. Yeah. <laughs> Mammoths grew well into their adult lives. Male woolly mammoths kept growing until age 40 and females until age 25. Till age 40? Yes, and mammoths may have lived up to age 60. That's based on comparisons with modern elephants. That is a long growth curve. Yes. And woolly mammoths were suited to live in cold, dry, open environments. They had small ears and short tails to help them minimize losing body heat. Their ears were similar in shape to human ears. Oh, weird. But much bigger. They're about 15 inches or 38 centimeters long. That is big, but it doesn't sound big for an elephant relative. Yes, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> As for the tail, there were only 21 vertebrae in the tail compared to 28 to 33 in modern elephants. Woolly mammoths had thick fat layers that were 3 to 4 inches or 8 to 10 centimeters deep beneath the skin, which also helped them stay warm. They had the long curved tusks and four molars. They replaced their molars six times in their life. What? <laughs> I thought all us mammals were stuck with two sets of teeth. I didn't realize mammoths got extra sets. <laughs> I'm jealous. I thought you would be. <laughs> Each set was larger and had more ridges. So the first set was actually about the same size as our molars. What? And the sixth set could be about one foot or 0.3 meters long and weigh four pounds or 1.8 kilograms. For one tooth? <laughs> one very large molar. I mean, we've seen it at the Western Science Center, actually. Yeah. Or, well, those were mastodon. We get the idea. 
and they got their sixth set of molars at around age 30. I think we saw some mammoth teeth there too. I remember the whole bunch of parallel lines for the mammoth, whereas the mastodon was a little bit more like our teeth. It's kind of like the cusp bumps on it. I guess about half their life they had to live with just one set of molars. They got their last set at age 30 and they lived to about age 60. Oh, yeah, that's true. Woolly mammoths had a large head with a dome and a short neck with fat storage, a high hump on the shoulder and a sloping back. It walked on its toes and had large fleshy pads on its feet. Its body was covered in fur ranging in length from a few inches to over three feet or 90 centimeters long. For like a single hair? Mm Mm-hmm. Wow, that is very long. There were also glands in the skin that secreted oils into the hair, and that would have helped with insulation, repelling water, and just give its coat a, a nice glossy sheen. The more of these adaptations to the cold I hear, the I just keep thinking, uh-oh, because <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about how there was like some pretty intense climate change warming the earth. Are you changing your mind? Maybe it wasn't all humans' fault? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Woolly mammoths had coarse, wiry hairs that were three to six times thicker than human hair, and then shorter, thinner hairs forming an underwool that was densely packed. That's another uh-oh. Yes, and there were long hairs on the tail. So it had this furry coat all over, and it varied in color from blonde to brown or almost black. The preserved hair is orange, but that's probably just a result of loss of natural pigment during its long burial. It probably did shed its fur in the spring, so that would have helped a little. Back to the tusks, the tusks were more curved than modern elephants, but there's a lot of individual variation with the tusks. It grew its tusks throughout its life, but then it slowed down as it became an adult, which is probably how we can tell how old it was through the tusks. Female tusks were smaller and thinner than male tusks, but the largest known tusk is 14 feet or 4.2 meters long and weighs 201 pounds or 91 kilograms. That's yeah, almost as long as like the largest mammoth overall. Yeah. More typical though is that they weighed 100 pounds or 45 kilograms and they were about 8 to 9 feet or 2.4 to 2.7 meters long. Still large. Yeah. They would have used their tusks and trunks to move things around, fight, and forage for food, like modern elephants, and also to clear snow to get to the grass. That's the one that I had heard of the most. Mm -hmm. The tip of the trunk had these two long finger-like projections, so it could wrap its trunk around large tufts of grass or break off leafy branches. I feel like elephants can do that too. Because we know they can hold a paintbrush. Yeah. (laughs) But I think it's even more pronounced with the mammoths. Hmm. At least the woolly mammoth. The woolly mammoths mostly ate grass and grass-like vegetation. They may have foraged up to 20 hours a day. A six-ton adult would need to eat nearly 400 pounds or 180 kilograms of food a day. They probably timed their breeding so their babies would be born in plant growth season so they could all eat. Some, again, pathologies have been found, including osteomyelitis, a bone infection, and arthritis. Some had gum disease, and some had teeth with cancerous growths. Scientists figured out that one woolly mammoth, known as Kick, walked about 43,500 miles or 70,000 kilometers in its life, which is almost enough to walk around the world twice. (laughs) That's pretty random. Yeah, it's a male that died almost 17,100 years ago in Alaska. It was 28 years old when it died. They analyzed the DNA and studied his tusks. And the isotopes in the tusks gave an idea of where the mammoth lived and where in Alaska it roamed around. They figured out he roamed the lower Yukon River Basin when he was young and was probably part of a herd. And then around age 16, there was a shift. Possibly he got kicked out of the herd. Maybe it was a matriarchal society. And then based on that, like male elephants get kicked out around that age. The last 18 months of Kick's life, he lived in a small area. It's possible he was sick or hurt. It seems that he starved to death. Mm. Just some quick math. That means Kick was walking about four to five miles a day, which would be about 10,000 steps a day, which is that random arbitrary number a lot of people try to do. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) That really adds up, those steps. Yeah. Again, there's been a lot of depictions of woolly mammoths in paintings, engravings, sculptures, and more than 70 dwellings are known 
that are made of woolly mammoth bones. 70? Yeah. That is a lot of dwellings. It could have been from scavenging or hunting. They use the large bones as foundations and the tusks for entrances. <laughs> oh. I've seen that in like cartoons and video games and stuff, but I always thought it was like a video game designer or a cartoonist being like, you know, if you take two mammoth tusks, they kind of make an arch like a doorway. They weren't the first ones <laughs> to come up with that idea. It was a real thing that they did. That's <laughs> crazy. So there is evidence of humans butchering woolly mammoths based on cut marks and breaks and stone tools found nearby. But again, could have been scavenging or hunting. Hmm. Because woolly mammoth populations died out over time. They didn't go extinct all at once. They mostly died out between 14,000 and 10,000 years ago, but the last known population died out about 4,000 years ago. So going back to that, you know, humans may have been a factor in their extinction, but that 2021 study found that climate change and changes in vegetation were the main causes. Okay. I'm convinced. Wow. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Well, I got to follow what the experts find because <laughs> I have not studied this. <laughs> no. It does seem like the humans definitely didn't help, but maybe they didn't hurt as much as I would assume, given how we've treated other animals. Mm. Maybe they were a little bit too big for us to completely drive to extinction like we did with some of the slightly smaller animals. There might be more future studies that find something different. I don't know, but... For now, that's the thinking. I was mostly thinking of the study that I saw that was basically saying Homo erectus and some of our human ancestors were basically hyper carnivores until they ran out of stuff to hunt. Hmm. And then they like by necessity switched to eating more fruit and grains and things like that. So I assumed woolly mammoths were a part of that equation, the large meat sources that humans were going through for a hmm. while. Doesn't sound like they were. No, and it doesn't really line up time-wise now that I'm thinking about it because like Homo erectus was way, way, way before woolly mammoths went extinct. Well, we'll leave it to the experts. Mm -hmm. As for our fun fact, there are several organizations working on quote-unquote resurrecting woolly mammoths. So humans may not have made mammoths go extinct, but they might bring them back. <laughs> so maybe we will help <laughs> in a way... <laughs> it's not going to be exactly the woolly mammoth. It's going to be like a Jurassic Park hybrid because the process would be combining DNA from frozen mammoths with DNA from an Asian elephant, its closest living relative. I thought there was another version where they were taking out basically the entire genome and replacing the genome in an egg cell and using that style of cloning. From what I read... The idea is you make embryos in the lab with DNA from mammoths and you mix it with Asian elephants. You use skin cells and then you edit them to carry the mammoth genes. And then you create an egg from those stem cells and replace the nucleus with the nucleus from the skin cell with the mammoth DNA. And then you have the elephant be a surrogate mother. Yeah. So that's not, if you're replacing the entire nucleus from the mammoth into the elephant, there isn't really going to be any DNA of the Asian elephant left mm. in the end. So it will basically be purely a mammoth at that point. From what I read, it's not purely a mammoth, <laughs> so I don't want to say that. Much closer than in Jurassic Park where it was like we're filling in the gaps in the DNA with like all sorts of random stuff. Well, a lot of mammoth mummies have been found mm -hmm. so scientists can study the soft tissue and DNA. They got a lot to work with. A lot more to work with than with dinosaurs. Yeah. And there have been several methods proposed. There's one company, Colossal, that has 15 million US dollars in funding to genetically resurrect woolly mammoths. Is that enough? $15 million <laughs> seems very low for a project like that. I don't know. They're saying that they can do something in the next few years. Can you even like make an enclosure at a zoo for $15 million large enough for a mammoth? I'll have to ask someone who works at a zoo. Are they just going to cut it loose? Like, that's, well, that, that does not seem like enough money. <laughs> that is part of the potential issue. In this case, the company is hoping that it can help combat climate change with the idea being that mammoths helped maintain permafrost by removing layers of snow so the cold air reached the soil. Snow can insulate and warming up permafrost leads to releasing greenhouse gases. 
But there are some scientists that are skeptical that a resurrected mammoth can help with climate change. Mammoths, having them around would get rid of a lot of trees and compact the ground and turn the area into more grassland, which would help keep the ground cool. But trees and moss also can help protect permafrost, so getting rid of it might not help. Mm. There are other organizations also working on bringing back mammoths, or at least a mammoth-elephant hybrid, where they'd give Asian elephants traits to help them live in the Arctic, so they would look and probably act like a mammoth. (laughs) That sounds a lot more complicated, though. If you have, like, the full genetic material of a mammoth, you don't really have to mess with it and try to, like, tweak the Asian elephant for a long time. Just make the mammoths. I don't know what's more cost-effective. There's a lot of debate around all of this. You know, there's not much of a mammoth-like habitat left. You need a lot of individuals because they're social. And the scientific benefits are unclear. Like, it might be better to help preserve endangered species like elephants or the white rhino or giant panda. But that's sort of a fallacy of relevance in the informal logical fallacies where it's like, yes, you could always put more effort into a more important cause, But that doesn't mean that no other causes should ever be worked on. Mm. And there's ethics around having elephants be surrogate mothers, and it's unknown if new pathogens would come from de-extincting mammoths. That last one seems really unlikely. Mm. (laughs) It's just all part of the debate. Yeah. I remember we were watching a show, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but they were going back in time and like saving, was it Prehistoric Park? Was that the name of it? I think that was it. And they had this like time travel gate. They would go back in time and they would save an animal before it went extinct and put it into this park environment. Mm -hmm. And they went and they got a mammoth. And what they did was they put it in with a bunch of elephants because they were like, well, they're social, but they're close relatives. So maybe they'll get along. And I think they did. But I think the, the high temperature was a little bit of an issue for the mammoth. It's meant to live in the cold. It's built for it. Yeah. And that makes you think, Even if they did get along with Asian elephants, Asian elephants aren't going to want to live in the tundra. That's why you got to change the Asian elephants. (laughs) Yeah, or make a whole bunch of the mammoths. Mm -hmm. It does seem like a little bit of not the right solution to climate change. Genetically engineering the mammoths to come back, it seems like that's sort of a very minor potential benefit. And like you said, maybe even a negative, depending on how it fleshes out. Well... We'll see how this all plays out in a few years. There's another concern that the place where mammoths used to live has changed. There's different plants and animal life there now, too. Yeah, for sure. And what what impact does it have on the current animals there if a mammoth shows up and starts changing literally the ground that they all live in or on? I'll tell you, it has a mammoth impact. Uh. (laughs) And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino slash I Know Paleo. We hope you enjoyed this extra special bonus bonus episode. (laughs) Again, if you're a Patreon at the Triceratops level and above, you can get stuff like this every month. And that's at patreon.com slash inodino. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be talking about a new dinosaur as well as Netflix's Life on Our Planet series with some of the behind the scenes info. Thanks again. And until next time. (laughs) 